wanted to introduce Maya. She's a biological dentist. And um, I feel that it was so important to organize a talk with um, biological dentistry methods because it's so aligned with everything that we do here in terms of um, healing overall the body. We feel that everything is connected to the mouth. Every one of your teeth say a story about how your body's functioning. And I think Maya can take it from there and explain the details on that. There's so much to cover. So, all right, thank you. Oh, you have your furry thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Nat. Thank you guys so much for taking your time out to be here with me today. And um, a few years ago, uh, I had a friend who was also a patient who called me and said, hey, Maya, did you hear that I had lymphoma? And I said, yeah, I heard. And he said, funny thing is, they did a PET scan of me. And out of all of the places that lit up, an old root canal tooth also lit up. And I said at the time, I said, ah, you know, I've heard the rumors. It hasn't been proven. I wouldn't give it any thought. That's how I addressed that concern with the patient. Shortly after that, I had a patient who was initially very nervous in the chair. And she said to me, she said, you know, I don't have pain, but I have a really weird sensation right here, right under my nose. And I said, well, let's look into it. So we evaluated the teeth associated with that area. It was actually a necrotic tooth or a dead tooth. And it ended up being a root canal tooth. Root canal specialist came in tried to figure out why she still had the sensation that she had. And he couldn't figure it out. Basically, what he said to me was, it's all in her head. So I had a decision to make at that time. I could tell the patient that it was all in her head, or I could continue to pursue the reason why she was feeling the way she felt. And so I did. I brought another specialist in. And he said to me, OK, let's do this. Let's open it up at the tip where she's feeling it at the tip of the root canal and let's evaluate it that way and I said okay so we bring her in he's a very tan doctor and he comes to me white and I'm like what's up what's going on and he says well this is a procedure called the apicoectomy it's when we open everything up from the roots and look in and we treat it backwards. And he says, I've never in all of my years seen anything like this. It looks like papaya seeds up there. And I said, okay, let's biopsy. So we biopsied and we send it to University of Florida. And a few weeks later, we received the results and it was negative. So I brought the patient in. I told her everything was fine. And, you know, you can go, everything was fine, and go on your way. The next day, they called us from University of Florida to the office, and they said, don't tell the patient the result yet. And I said, we already told the patient the result. What's going on? They said during grand rounds, there was something that one of the residents saw on the slide, and they decided to retest it. And when they retested it, it turned out that she indeed had B-cell lymphoma. So I had to bring the patient back in. I had to t give her the second copy of the report, explain to her what happened. And from there, I sent her to the oncologist. She ended up at University of Miami to be treated. The oncologist at University of Miami called me after he met with her and evaluated her. And he said, I want you to know that we did a complete PET scan of her. And the only place that she has B-cell lymphoma is there. And the incidence of having B-cell lymphoma only there is 0.02%. So he said, please explain to me how I'm getting this patient from the dentist and how we're here. So I explained everything that happened clinically, everything that we did. And I told him, I said, you know what, doctor, at the end of the day, I listened to my patient and I pursued it to the end because the patients know their bodies. And if we don't listen to them, we can miss things like this. It would have been years before this was diagnosed everywhere else in her body. And guys, 
that began a journey for me that completely shifted my paradigm, completely changed the way that I practice, caused me to unlearn things that I had already learned, relearn things, and I'm still relearning on this journey. I want to thank God for giving me the blessing so that I can be a blessing to other people, blessing me with a beautiful family, an amazing team that supports me every day. And guess what? They had to unlearn everything they knew and relearn everything with me. And they did it with grace and support, and I am forever grateful. I dug deep. I dug deep and I got associated with all of the biological, holistic associations. I read research paper. When I was in dental school, I was busy learning how to be a technician of the mouth so that I could try the best that I could to fit that crown as perfect as I could or do that filling as perfect as I could. And yes, we did get medical background. How do you evaluate a patient? How are you going to treat the patient if they have diabetes or if they have this? But the connections were never made in dental school. And so I learned a lot. And this is how I'm standing here in front of you all today as a biological dentist. And I have a few things to share. But for a minute, for a couple of minutes, let's put the mouth and the teeth to the side. I want you to understand that life is energy and vibration. Everything in health boils down to the pH or the voltage associated with the cell. So, Dr. Tennant, I don't know if you all are familiar with his work, but what he has discovered is that for the cell to function properly, it has to function at negative 25 millivolts. Bear with me here, I'm not gonna make it too crazy. So for a normal cell to function, negative 25 millivolts. For a cell to regenerate, negative 50 millivolts are required. And it is when voltage is not present to regenerate that we start to see chronic illness set in. So there are three things that are required really for regeneration and our body is constantly regenerating. Different systems regenerate at different paces. Your macula regenerates every six days, your skin every six weeks, your complete uh, neurological system every eight months, something like that. So regeneration is very important for the continuous function of the body. And so voltage needs to be present in the proper amount to regenerate and nutrients need to be present when the voltage is present in order to do what it needs to do. And we need to be able to stay away from toxins because the toxins are going to stop us from being able to regenerate even if we have the right nutrients and the right voltages. So toxins like heavy metals, GMO, glyphosate, gly, gly, I never say this word properly, glyphosates. And so very important to understand that the, we are now now that we know that we're all about voltage down to the level of the cell we are walking rechargeable batteries if you understand that for a second you're going to get to where i want to get to with you there are four rechargeable batteries in our body system the muscles the cell membrane the mitochondria and the dna the muscles are stacked together like, you know how a flashlight is? The muscles are stacked like, think about the muscles like batteries in a flashlight. They need to be aligned the proper way for the energy to go through them. So you have muscle stacks, and around the muscle you have something called fascia. You ever cut a turkey and you see the white, stringy, shiny thing that comes off of the meat? That's fascia. So you have muscle stacks, you have fascia, and these stacks are points that energize or send the voltage that is necessary to certain organ systems in the body. So fascia acts as a conductor. A conductor is something that will conduct electrons at the speed of light and it will go in one direction. So you've got your muscles. Why are the muscles conductors? Why are the muscles rechargeable batteries? Muscles are called piezoelectric. So piezoelectric means when you put stress on something, it creates electrons for you. 
So our muscles, our biggest battery pack, right? Because we're going from muscles to cell membrane to mitochondria to DNA. Our biggest muscles, when you strain them, they're creating electrons for you. That's why exercise is so important, okay? So every muscle stack point associated with an organ system is called an acupuncture meridian, okay? These acupuncture meridians are circuits in our bodies, and they run in specific ways. And all of these circuits loop. There are 12 main loops, okay? And all of them loop through our teeth. All of them loop to specific areas in our oral cavity. There are some instances where these power packs stop working. These power packs can stop working for four main reasons. The first main reason is thyroid deficiency because your T3 is re responsible for the voltage to the cell membrane and your T2 is responsible for the voltage to your mitochondria. Another instance where these power packs will stop working is for scars, deeper scars, not like a little scar in your body, but if you have a deep scar in a main area somewhere, this can disrupt the ability for the voltage to go where it needs to go. The other thing believe it or not, is emotion. In our bodies, emotion are responsible, they are magnetic fields. So we have to bring emotion into this because different emotions blocked somewhere will create a blockage in the voltage system as well. And finally, dental infections. Dental infections anywhere in the mouth will also cause a breakdown in this voltage system. And I want you now to imagine that teeth are circuit breakers. So you've got a whole electric system innervating. The electric system works like a Tesla coil. So the systems talk to each other. So if you have a breakdown in one area of your body, the other area knows what's going on. And the teeth are actually the circuit breakers in the system. All right. So teeth in the circuit breaker, being the circuit breaker, teeth actually act like a lymphatic system. So just like our lymphatic system will catch any type of pathogens to try to protect and, you know, get rid, in this electric system, our teeth are the lymphatic system for this circuit. And when something goes wrong with the teeth, the entire system can be out of whack. Teeth themselves are, have their own little pump system, their own electrical pump system. So when the teeth are pumping uh, liquid in and out well, the teeth stay healthy. When the pump is disrupted, like for example, an electromagnetic field coming from an emotion that you can't get rid of in a certain area, this will disrupt the pump and that's when decay occurs. I mean, it's multifactorial, but it plays a very important role that we're never taught in dentistry about. This pump will be disturbed by an electromagnetic field, which can come from energy. It can come from corrosion. It can come from, and I'll talk about the different aspects of the teeth. And so guys, that's the missing link. Being introduced to the biohacking world by Natasha, I opened my mind into so many different aspects of holistic health. And I'm so grateful to that. So we know that these power packs can stop working, and we know that voltage, nutrients, and toxins play a role. Now let's get into teeth. So I came together with a couple of things that we can all learn and walk out of here right away, knowing things, toxins to stay away from, toxins to look for, and things that we can do. So the first thing I want to talk about in form of toxin is fluoride. Fluoride is a very dangerous developmental neurotoxin. Fluoride is a reactive halogen, the most reactive halogen. What does that mean? That means that fluoride wants to displace iodine. It wants to replace calcium. And so we're introducing fluoride to prevent tooth decay, but what's happening at the same time is it's displacing and replacing and messing up the function of our bodies down to the level of the mitochondrial function. Fluoride is toxic. Because fluoride is so reactive, it's great for phosphate fertilizer, it's great for aluminum, steel companies, but it's a byproduct. 
actually the fluoride that is placed in our drinking water is fluorosilicic acid and they get that from the smokestacks of these factories did you know the smoke stacks of these factories have little nets around them that catches fluoride and that actually is taken put in a, 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 a container with skull and bones on it and shipped to water treatment plants and put in our water to drink as far as I'm concerned this is uninformed consent because a medication is something that is used to treat a disease. And when a medication is being added to our water without our consent, this is uninformed consent. So the people who support fluoride say fluoride is safe enough in this part per million or in this part per million. But nowadays, fluoride is not only in our drinking water in a lot of counties, Broward and Miami-Dade for sure. It's in our dental products. It's in the concentrated juice. It's in medication. It's everywhere. So how can you control the parts per million that you're getting? You cannot. So I'm drinking a glass full of tap water and my son is drinking a glass full of tap water and we're getting different, different effects because fluoride as a developmental neurotoxin is not only dose dependent, it's timing dependent. So depending on where that person is in their development of a certain system, it's going to mess them up more if they have a little more. And there is no way to control the dose of fluoride that we're getting. If you read the back of a toothpaste, it will tell you, and actually, you know, on my journey to researching this, I learned about a young three-year-old boy who went to his doctor in New Jersey who got a fluoride treatment who got a higher dose than he should have and died the same day. Look it up. It's right there. It's documented. But all the forces are trying to stop us from being able to see this because a lot of people benefit from selling their toxic waste as a product that we should be using. Yeah, it stops decay, but it's dangerous. It's a neurotoxin. It can kill you. So I'm like, okay, what can I use in my office to remineralize teeth, but not create harmful neurological effects for my patients? And when I talk about this subject, I talk about being sure that you're filtering your water, staying away from concentrated juices, making sure you read the label on everything, and then choosing a toothpaste that will remineralize your teeth, but at the same time not have the potential harmful effects that fluoride has. And so we choose nanohydroxyapatite as our favorite to remineralize teeth, to decrease sensitivity, and to help teeth stay healthy. So on this topic, people often ask me, because I talk about toothpaste and fluoride, so what should we be doing? So what we should be doing, really, I highly recommend coconut oil pulling. Um, I've worked my way up to 20 minutes in the morning. It's actually a really hard thing to do. If you try it for two minutes, it's really hard. So I like to take raw coconut paste, put it in my mouth like a teaspoon, emulsify it until it becomes a liquid and then suck it, pull it through my teeth. It's detoxifying, it's good for the teeth, it actually even whitens the teeth, it's an antiseptic and it's natural. So we're gonna do this and not only is it good on the level of the mouth, but it is a great workout. I don't know if you guys have seen me, you've seen my journey throughout all of this, I've been working on myself too, my entire facial structure has changed. That's my workout in the morning for my jaw. You guys do it for at least eight weeks and you will see a big difference in your musculature, in your neck, amazing. After I do that, I tongue scrape with a copper tongue scraper and I use a nano hydroxy appetite based toothpaste. So I really like Boca, Boca is my favorite, um, but we also use Risewell uh, as well. As long as it has something to remineralize the teeth and it's not fluoride. We like coco floss, and at the end of that, we are no longer using Listerine or alcoholic rinses. This is really killing our microbiome. And so what we're re recommending now is an oral probiotic, which is a lozenge that gets dissolved in the mouth, which will help us control the good to bad bacteria in the oral microbiome. Let's talk about oral microbiome for a second. How many of you have had your oral microbiome tested? Okay very important to do 
just like the gut microbiome controls everything, the mouth is the beginning of the gut. So 40% of the microbiome that is shared in the gut is also shared in the mouth. And so it's a spit test. You can do it at your biological dentist, or you can even do it online. The one that we use at the office is Bristle, and it will come back with a wealth of information. What is your good to bad bacteria? Where is your bad breath coming from? Did you know there are seven places that bad breath can come from? And this test can tell you exactly where it is. So with these tests, we're able to be much more intentional. Maybe the way you do your morning routine isn't the same way you should do your morning routine. Let's find out, now that we have these tools that can give us the insight, let's be more intentional and let's find out exactly how we should protect our system. So definitely no more, no more mouthwash, for sure. Okay, guys. So I'm with Nat. I'm involved with the biohack. Life is good. And she tells me, I have this test called the oligo scan. This is like, I think, two years ago already. Let me test your heavy metals. So I'm like, okay, here. You know, when Nat tells me to do something, I'm like, do it. And we test me. And I have an extremely, had an extremely high mercury and aluminum level, extremely high. So there I go again, I start researching mercury. And I remember, I think Matthew was there and he goes, oh, you, you know, maybe you have those black fillings. And I said, no, I don't have them. I never had them in my mouth. Or do you eat fish all the time? Because fish is a big source of mercury toxicity. No, I don't eat fish all the time. I actually choose not to eat fish all the time. So I'm researching this in one of my uh, biological associations, and I find out that maybe, was it 15 years at the time? 15 years of removing these mercury fillings from people's mouth. It wasn't even in my mouth. Removing them unsafely, the wrong way, created a mercury toxicity in me, and it's not even my mouth. So I look into this further, and I find out that we, we were taught in dental school to call these amalgam fillings or to call them silver fillings. We were never taught to call them mercury fillings. They are more than 50% mercury. And what we're taught in dental school is when you mix the mercury with the silver, it renders the mercury innate. That is not true. Every single time you chew, every single time you rub your teeth together or brush your teeth, a little bit of mercury vapor escapes into the body. And mercury is the most dangerous toxin on the planet. And it's affecting more people than you know. And it's affecting mostly the gen our generation a little bit, but the generation of our parents a lot. And it's highly, highly correlated. This is research-based evidence to show that it's highly, highly related to Alzheimer's disease, neurological problems. This is called the smoking tooth test. So they took an extracted tooth with a mercury filling in it, and they rubbed it for a few seconds with an eraser, and they put it behind this green screen, which could capture vapors. And this is mercury vapor coming off of that extracted tooth. Then the ADA doesn't recommend that we remove them. But the EPA says, yes, we acknowledge the research. A little bit of mercury vapor is indeed released every single time. But we don't consider these levels to be dangerous enough. So let me tell you something, guys. I'm going to give you a little bit of arsenic every day in very little doses. But it's not going to hurt you because the dose is really small. You decide what you want to do. But this is one of the biggest silent killers that we face. And 40% of dentists in the United States still place them. And almost 100% of dentists remove them the wrong way. Because if you're going to remove them, imagine my chewing is going to release a little bit of mercury vapor. What happens when I go in at 6,000 RPM to remove it? Chunks of it are flying, getting swallowed by the patient, getting inhaled by me. And if that chunk that I took out of your tooth, I took it and I put it in the sink, guess what? I get an EPA violation. 
So if we're removing this, we need to do it the smart way. Safe mercury amalgam removal technique. This is a technique that protects the patient, it protects the team, and it also protects the environment, which is important because all of this stuff that's coming out is going into our waters. Vicious cycle. With SMART, it's a little claustrophobic. I know some of you guys probably watching have gone through this with me, but this is what you look like, okay? Like being at the dentist wasn't bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> this is how I'm gonna remove it. This is gradual. I've graduated into being able to do, to learn the proper way to do this. Now this is how we remove them, okay? So we completely isolate the tooth that we're working on with a rubber dam. The patient has oxygen flowing through their nose. There is a huge, you see that little thing that looks like an elephant trunk? That's um, an extra oral suction. You have suction under the dam, you have suction over the dam, suction outside, and the patient is completely covered from head to toe. We wear special masks to filter so that we don't breathe it in. We're basically kind of like in hazmat suits when we're doing it, okay? Close up of what it looks like. And when we remove them, we try to chunk them out. We don't try to drill them out. We'd like actually try to take them out in chunks to create less vapor. Super important if you're having this done, if you're in another state and you're having it done, you need to look for somebody who's actually certified to do this procedure because it's a rigorous certification. You not only have to know that, prove that you know the processes, but you have to prove that your office is handled and equipped to handle this. This is very dangerous. Once the mercury is out, we irrigate with activated charcoal. And at this point, I should mention that it's very important if you recognize that you have these in your mouth and that you are going to remove them, that you partner up. Your dentist has to partner up with your functional medicine doctor to help you detox. Dr. Sienna and I were actually talking about some really amazing ways that we can collaborate together through the biohack lab in order to help our patients detox properly. Because if you don't, you're just pushing this around. So this is one of the hardest metals to get rid of. And if you don't detox properly, you're just pushing it around. Does that make sense? When you remove them, you have to be as conservative as possible. So we try to restore teeth as biomimetically as possible, which means we try to mimic the anatomy and the flexure of the enamel to the dentin as close as possible. We try to avoid crowns as much as possible for many reasons, but sometimes we have to do crowns. And when we do, we try to make sure that we're as conservative as we can and that we choose materials that mimic the anatomy as close as possible to enamel. Let's talk about root canals for a second. When a tooth becomes irreversibly inflamed, so a tooth is its own system with its own nervous system inside of it. And when decay approaches the nerve or when a tooth becomes traumatized, the nerve inside will become inflamed, irreversibly inflamed. And once that happens, the nerve then decides to die inside the tooth. And a great way that dentists found to get a patient out of pain is to go in with very thin and exact instruments to remove the dead nerve tissue. They remove the dead nerve tissue they clean it, clean it, clean it, and then they stuff it up with like a rubbery or putty material, and then we put a crown on top of that. A root canal is still a great way to get a patient out of pain. A root canal is still a great way before a patient has to lose a tooth, but I want you guys to know, and now I discuss with all of my patients when they're making that decision, there are health ramifications to having a root canal done. Because basically what we're doing is taxiderming the tooth. We're leaving, we are really the only profession that leaves a dead organ in your body if it becomes infected. And that's what a root canal is. It's a dead organ in the body. So 
it is a good way to get you out of pain. It is a good way to keep your tooth, but it does have health ramifications. Does everybody who walks into my practice, do I tell them they have to get all of their root canal teeth taken out? No, I don't. But what I tell them as a biological dentist is let's see what's going on with your specific biology. And let's figure out if you're walking in with autoimmune situation that nobody can figure out, most likely we're going to look at taking all the root canal teeth out. But we take a look at these root canal teeth by 3D imaging, okay? And so we can see what's going on on a 3D image much more than what we can see on a 2D image. And we determine whether or not we keep them, monitor them, or get rid of them. And if we're going to get rid of them, it's very important that we do the extractions biologically. What does that mean? When a tooth is taken out, every tooth sits in a ligament. And when we take out a tooth, it's very important to clean the socket from the ligament that's there. Nowadays, we are using, not only do we take the tooth out, we clean the ligament out with a laser. Now, we use a laser. <laughs> um, we also use ozone. Okay, so we insufflate the socket and we irrigate the socket with ozonated water, ozonated gas, and we use the laser not only to decontaminate the socket, but to also pulse. It's amazing when you see this. When my laser goes on in the room, my soap dispensers start going off by themselves. And it's safe. It doesn't have any type of uh, radiation. It's light in a safe uh, um, spectrum of light so it doesn't cause any uh, malignancies or anything but this is so powerful that it's getting everything nice and clean the way that it should because if you don't clean the socket the ligament will stay and the body will think that the ligament is still there and it will not heal around it properly it will heal with something called the cavitation which i'll get into also very important part of a biological extraction is prf this is where we draw blood, we spin it, and we get platelet-rich fibrin to form a, either a membrane or a clot, and we put it back in. So it takes your body at least 10 days to get all of these things to the site of the extraction. So when we're doing it the day of the extraction, we're actually biohacking your body to be able to heal 10 times faster than it normally would. Day of surgery, we're putting all of these things in. All of our assistants are certified phlebotomists, and we will not do a surgery without PRF because we've seen how the patients are healing. Most patients say they didn't even have to take the pain medication that they were given. Um, and this is a great, great thing that happened to dentistry. If a wisdom tooth is just yanked, and nothing is cleaned out and no PRF is put in, what will happen is the jawbone will heal. Uh, um, infection will stay inside the jawbone and it will heal around it. And so you cannot see that there's actually a cavitation with dead bone in the middle. And you cannot see this on a 2D image. You have to see it on a 3D image to be able to uh, recognize that it's there. And the wisdom teeth run on the heart meridian. So now it's, it's so much more complex than that. It's the heart, it's the associated vertebrae, it's which part of the autonomic nervous system that it's associated with. So it's much more than that. So chronic pain, a patient that has chronic pain or chronic issues that has gone to every doctor and had every test done, their last resort is to check whether or not they have cavitations that are hidden in the jawbone. It's not only wisdom tooth, it can happen at another extraction site as well. So we go in, we access it, we clean it out the same way that I, I said with the laser and the ozone and we put the PRF in and we allow that bone to heal back properly. But what we do as part of this treatment is we take a little bit of that biological material and we send it to a lab. And the lab does a PCR evaluation of all of the pathogens that are existing in that area. We also do this when we take out root canal teeth. And the pathogens that come back are nasty pathogens. Most of these pathogens don't belong because, yes, we have bugs in our body that belong there. But these pathogens don't belong there. And in a lot of the cases that we've done, we've identified parasites here. When people think of parasites, they think here. We've identified parasites here. 
living, flourishing. We've identified cadaverines in root canal teeth that have been chronically infected. These are the proteins that the bacteria form on a cadaver. Okay, so again, we're evaluating the health of the root canal. We're not taking all of them out, but if it's chronically inflamed and chronically infected and you have a problem in your biology that you're trying to solve, it may be the solution. But the study shows, and it's there, it's right there with every patient that we treat that we are taking out some big disruptors. Okay, so you take a tooth out, how are you going to replace it? The best way to replace a missing tooth is an implant. But we have different types of implants. We have titanium implants and we have zirconia implants. These days, with the research that I have learned, I am preferring zirconia implants. Because zirconia is a very biocompatible material in the mouth, but sometimes we have to use titanium. And if we use titanium, we like to make sure that we use a grade of titanium, which is safe with your specific biology. And I'll get to that a little bit further. We should also recognize that the way that a patient is breathing is very, very important. If a child is a mouth breather, or a child is a mouth breather that eats a lot of processed foods, the jaw is not forming in the proper way. The tongue is not resting on the palate, so the jaw is forming uh, uh, wrong. And that will make us susceptible to decay, susceptible to uh, misalignment of teeth. A lot of problems result just from the way that the patient is taught to breathe. And so now we know to bring in myofunctional therapists, and now we know to recognize this earlier on, not just in adults. And when an adult tells me that they clench and grind their teeth at night, I used to tell them that they were stressed out and that that was the cause. But we now know that it's very, very closely related to airway disorder. Upper airway resistance syndrome is one of the silent killers again. Because what's happening is if you're grinding your teeth and you're snoring, you're not just that annoying person to your spouse, you're potentially being pushed underwater several times at night. So you're fighting and fighting for your life at night when your body is supposed to be recuperating and regenerating, you're actually fighting. So no regeneration happens, no oxygen gets there, no nitric oxide is delivered because you're not breathing through your nose. And so your dentist should be able to recognize whether or not this is going on. And I'm not always right. Sometimes the test will come back and the well, patient doesn't have anything. But if I see signs that you're grinding your teeth or signs that you are like you are a six-foot tiger trapped inside a four-foot cage, I'm going to make sure that I expand your airway or that I evaluate your airway because this is that... 50-year-old person who was relatively healthy who had a stroke out of the blue because they're not recuperating and they're not getting the oxygen that everything needs at night. Periodontal disease is also very important to take care of. And when we do that, we now use ozone to decontaminate the site. And sometimes we use ozone in conjunction with the laser. Biocompatibility testing is one of the, so if you come, come to me and now I, we recognize that you need a, a little bit of work that needs to be done, what I will recommend is a biocompatibility test. I want to know that the filling that I put in your biology is okay for you and the crown that I put in your biology is okay for you. So it's a blood test that we can run that will test all dental materials against your specific biology. And because dental materials are foreign materials that we are putting in the body, all of them are reactive to the body, except for zirconia. It's the only one that's never come back reactive. But so I want to know what's least reactive. It's not a good thing to have to have dental treatment done. But if you have to have dental treatment done, let's do it where your body is not going to be reactive to it. So at this point, what I say is, let's say you were gluten intolerant and you ate gluten, your body would have a bad reaction for a few days and then you'd be able to get rid of that. But what if you were intolerant to something that was a permanent fixture in your body? 
what happens then? Your C-reactive proteins go up, your body is busy fighting something that it can never get rid of because we've installed it in your mouth as a permanent fixture. So being able to recognize and know your body and know what your body is least reactive to is very important. Another important thing is the nutritional deficiencies. Knowing your micro and macronutrients is very important. Making sure that you are, remember that part where voltage, nutrients, and toxins came in? This is the nutrient part. If your body has enough voltage and you are, you know, you're eating clean and you've gotten rid of all of your toxins, but you don't have the nutrients there, it's not going to be able to regenerate your body. So making sure that you have the proper nutrients, minerals, vitamin C, um, this is great. This is a dental um, out of Germany a dental uh, bone health regeneration uh, supplement company, which I've recently discovered, which is good. But, you know, talking to our young patients about how they eat and the nutritional value of what they, you know, incorporating nutrition, instead of telling, instead of telling the mom, you didn't brush your kid's teeth with fluoride and that's why they got the cavity, we should talk about, okay, how much processed food is your child eating and you know how what are their nutrients like are they lacking in any type of vi d vitamins or anything like that and of course detoxing with chlorella zeolite and using some good biohacks like infrared saunas to help detox in conjunction with your functional medicine doctor with some of the IVs and plasmas that we can do to help you regenerate and get rid of some of the toxins. Very, very important. Lymphatic drainage, much, much more, which you'll find here in this space. Things to look for. Another thing to look for is making sure that the dental office that you go to cleans their water lines. Dental offices run on, on water lines, right? The drill, the water, the suction, all of that is connected through a piping system. And so it's important when you sit in that chair to know that the tubes that have been sucking the saliva out of the previous patient have been cleared. In our office, we clear this between each and every patient for two minutes. And for me, this is, this is important. I don't want to sit in the chair. And when my hygienist tells me, close your mouth around the suction, I don't want to close it and get backflow from the previous patient. And I want to make sure that they're cleaning their water lines properly, decontaminating them, and what we call shocking the water lines on a regular basis and checking the water lines on a regular basis. Your dental office should be able to show you a log of when they tested their water lines, when they maintained their water lines, and how they're doing it. So for us as biological dentists, and specifically in our practice, we're clearing our lines for two minutes between each and every patient every single time. Most offices will only do this between when they had a big surgery, sometimes at the end of the day, sometimes like once a week. But I believe, and I don't want to offend anybody who's listening here, but I believe that this should be done between every single patient, every single time, and the water lines are probably the most overlooked thing in a dental office. Of course, you want them to be nice. Of course, you want them to be clean. Of course, you want them to be good. <laughs> Maybe you're interested as to whether or not they take your insurance, but what you should be interested in really is whether or not those suction lines are absolutely clean before you sit in that chair. The other thing is to make sure that there's technology. Nowadays, we have so much advances in technology, it's the best time to be in dentistry. Do they have lasers to make your life easier? Can she cut a cavity with a laser or does he have to use a drill? What's the difference? Less tooth structure removed, less chance that that tooth will need to go under root canal therapy, less chance that we're having that conversation where you have to decide whether or not you're going to do the root canal or take your tooth out. Sometimes it's inevitable and we deal with it, but it's very, very important. Guys, everything is connected. Everything is voltage. This voltage runs through our teeth and our oral cavity. And it's very important to make sure that we recognize that our mouth is not separate from the rest of the body. I don't know at which point they separated the mouth from medicine 
or they separated the eyes from medicine. But I can tell you that the mouth is the most important and you cannot fully optimize your health if you don't optimize your mouth, for sure. Thank you guys so much for your time. I appreciate everybody being here. I know some of you guys have listened to this lecture already and I appreciate you all. I think we're opening it up to some questions now. Anybody have any qu anybody in the room have any question with the Zoom? Hi. Zoom, we have some Zoom questions. Do we have any Zoom questions? No. <laughs> in, in, in our practice, we have chosen to be off of all restricted lists, which means we are not in network, but as a courtesy, we do file on behalf of our patients. And so, yes, we do, but we are out of network providers. Uh, does that make sense? And how do those claims, how do they proceed? Yes. The filing? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can you explain the relationship between teeth and voltage? You spoke about a loop that goes through the teeth. <clears throat> it's also my understanding that teeth are connected to various organs. Yes. Can you, can you explain us a little bit more about that? Yes. So there are 12 major energetic meridians connected to those battery packs that we talked about. And through electroacupuncture, they've been able to actually map the associated organs and the associated nerve cells. So if you can take a look at this, this is the meridian chart that I specifically okay. use. Electroacupuncture has been able to identify where the major energy stacks are. So that muscle battery with the fascia associated with it is an acupuncture point. And they're able to put the acupuncture point there and measure how much energy goes in that specific loop. It's a mixture of Chinese medicine and modern biological medicine that comes together to give you the, the graft. So for example, if you had an infection in, I can't see it very, very closely here, but if you had an infection in this tooth, okay, which is your upper right molar, it will potentially affect the voltage through all of these sensory organs, joints, vertebrae, uh, organs that are running uh, down, this, down this loop. And there are ways to test this disconnect in the circuit by using electroacupuncture by Vo. So Maya, is it safe to say that in diagnosing some potential chronic illnesses or, or deficiency in a particular organ that we, the doctors should go through the process of elimination in checking the teeth? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, oftentimes, I will have patients referred to me from their functional medicine doctors because they are working with them. They identified what needs to be done, but they need them to get rid of the interferences at the level of the oral cavity prior because they know it's going to be a big hindrance in what they're trying to achieve. So the good uh, doctors are the ones that are evaluating you, putting a plan in place, but identifying that you may have some oral interferences associated that need to be cleared up first. Uh, can you expand a little bit about the emotions and the teeth? Is that, yeah. <laughs> I think that's very new for some yeah. people. Yeah, it, it's very new. It's very new for me too, actually. But what Dr. Jerry Tennant explains is that teeth, because the teeth are kind of like the lymphatic system of this electric system, uh, teeth have the ability of holding on the... Um, the electromagnetic energy of an emotion. Does that make sense? It's so hard for me to explain, but teeth have the ability to hold on to the electromagnetic uh, uh, force of that specific emotion. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's not only teeth. We can hold different areas of our bodies, hold different emotions differently. And actually what Dr. Tennant says is he believes that chronic illness or a, a flip in voltage will actually occur only after a major emotional traumatic event will occur. And so it all ties in together where it's very important to be able to deal with your emotions, um, not only psychologically, but maybe put in a bigger, if emotions are a source of electromagnetics, maybe come in and supercharge the electromagnetic with a bigger pulse to be able to help dissipate that stuck energy there. Yes. So for patients, especially older ones like me. So, so, for, so for patients, I'm looking at the chart. So mm -hmm. for patients who have had their wisdom teeth removed, mm -hmm. some or all, are they at a disadvantage on their meridian because they no longer have those breakers? Not necessarily. Um, not having the not having the tooth there is not as bad as having an issue in the jawbone where the tooth used to be. So not everybody who had their wisdom teeth taken out healed with a cavitation, which is an interference. But if you were curious about that, what I would say is let's go to a biological dentist have a 3D evaluation of those areas to see if there are areas of low density where the, the bone is not as thick as the other areas. And that gives us an indication that there's a potential cavitation that needs to be cleaned out and treated. So if you had a really badly infected tooth there, it's better for you to have the tooth out. That will reconnect the circuit rather than having the infected tooth there, which will disconnect the circuit. Hi, could you explain what will happen if a person, all of their teeth has to be removed and they're um, pretty much have to use dentures? Yeah. Yeah, there are, there are so many things that go into that, and that's something that our office actually specializes in the most. There are so many aspects to having to have all of your teeth removed. Let's talk about the confidence, number one, okay? You go from having something solid in your mouth to having something that flip-flops and is removable. That's one. Number two, let's talk about the functional ability. People who love to eat steak and bananas and have confidence when they chew, you lose that ability as well. So when it comes to what we call end-stage dentition, this is when a patient, all of their teeth are decayed, all of their teeth have major chronic infections around them, and there's nothing more that we can do to repair the teeth. In this case, the patient has to have all of their teeth taken out. This will clear the energetic uh, uh, disconnect because the infections that are chronic that are causing the problem with the voltage no longer exist. However, now how do you deal with the psychological and functional aspect of not having any teeth? The good news is nowadays, we don't have to leave te people in dentures. Standard of care these days is to stabilize a denture with an implant, okay? something that at the minimum clicks in and clicks out, most of our patients are choosing something fixed, something screwed in, something they don't even have to remove. I remember as, as a courtesy to our patients sometimes, we go to, to um, retirement homes and help to treat their, you know, their loved ones that are older. And I will never forget this. Early on in my career where I went, to a very lovely, very posh retirement home. And I was treating, uh, she had a denture and she was one of the first African-American women to be formally educated. I think it was NYU. She had all of her certificates on the wall. Most amazing lady you could sit down and have a conversation with. Look, I have goosebumps. And all she wanted to do was be able to eat a banana she couldn't do it. 
So at the end of your life, after you're done doing everything that you do and accomplishing everything that you do, that's where quality of life matters the most. That's where she should have been able to eat that banana. That's where now with the technology that we have these days, we're no longer going to put our patients in that position. So you have to take all of your teeth out. You make sure that you stabilize them with implants because implants will retain the bone. They will retain the teeth that you need to have to chew and quality of life will be completely different. In this day and age, no reason for people to have to go into just removables anymore. Okay. I hope that answered your it question. Does. It does. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a second question for you. Uh, there were, I'm not sure what the water is called um, or the brand, where it was targeted towards young children. I think it might have had fluoride in it. Okay. Um, and people typically use it to mix with... Um, formula. With formulas. Yes. yes. Nursery and I, water. And I think it did something to yes. children's teeth. Can yeah. you expand on that, please? Yeah. So, uh, oh my God. Nursery water, if you, go, um, if you go to buy water for, to mix with formula, there's nursery water that comes with fluoride in it. And so it, it doesn't just affect the teeth. Now we know that it affects their development. So it delays, you know, it delays their IQ, it delays their mitochondrial function. It's setting them up for, uh, for, for failures developmentally. So it's actually nursery water that had fluoride in it um, and something very important to look out for. Actually, formulas too, some powdered formulas also have fluoride in them, so you have to be very careful with that. Of course, we know that nursing is the best thing you can do for your child, but it's sometimes not something that everybody can always do. And so choose your formula wisely and choose the water that you mix your formula with very wisely. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, so it's nursery water. Very practical question. You said something that kind of scared me, that one of the things that we have to look out for is how clean the pipes and the, and, and, and the, water, the water lines are. Yeah. Now, practically speaking, it's impossible for a, customer, for a patient to walk in and do that. Now, is there a third party uh, certification that exists yeah. that somebody can say, hey, do you have that certificate? Yes. that proves that all the lines are actually cleaned. Yes, and we, for example, we have a third party that tests our water lines on a regular basis. Um, it, is a, it is a requirement um, to, to practice in the state of Florida to have your water lines tested. We do it a little bit more than what's required, but we actually contract the, um, in California, what's the name of the university in California? So, Berkeley, uh, Stanford? Uh, I, I can't remember. I think it might be UCLA and I can't remember, but we contract there. They have a whole department dedicated to just water. Um, and so, so we so, contract them, so we send have, them a sample. Yeah, so do you have a name? Do you have a name that, that oh, people Oh, it's Loma can Linda, Loma Linda. Loma Linda University in California. So if you go on Loma Linda's website and you type in water um, evaluation, you will find uh, that information. Yeah, but if there. I go if I go to your clinic, yeah, and I say, hey, what what should I ask for as a certificate to be to be comfortable that your water lines are clean? What should I ask for? Can you show me your log of your water um, tests? Can you show me a log of your water test? And they should be able within two seconds, everybody knows where it is. They go, they grab it, they show it to you. Pass, 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 the dates that you had them. Yes, but is there like a particular body, a, 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 a company or an organization that people should look for that are more trusted than others? I mean, really that's the question yeah, I have. Uh, there are different organizations that do it. We use UCLA. Okay. Um, but so if you're walking into a dental office and you're evaluating whether or not they should be your dentist, you should be able to say, can you show me a log of your most recent um, a water testing of your water lines? And they I, should be able to show that to you. I wish the company itself would have a website where it shows people okay. that have all the past, you know, then it would be so much easier than going into the dentist place and asking for it. I wish that particular company that does all these flushes can actually expose them. 
Yeah. yeah. There is. I don't know. Oh, that's a good, uh, yeah, so it's a good thing to search, to, to ask them. Mm -hmm. And even that particular company can uh, say, hey, you know, hey, you can look us up on this particular platform. Um, mm -hmm. And here we are. That's how often we do our, yeah, could be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 It's important to, it's important to uh, mention that the governmental standards are not really stringent enough that alpha goes above and beyond that. Mm -hmm. uh, even, even if they had a log, it would be based on governmental standards and that you choose to go above and beyond that. Yeah. Yeah. So there, yeah, there are minimum requirements. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's what we feel comfortable right. doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Big difference. I get it. Yeah. So, so everybody has to go through it. Yeah, you have to, you have to trust your dentist doing that. Right. And to answer Mr. Coles, yes, ask the dentist. You have to trust your dentist doing that. And we ask for the water pipe. Yeah. I want to I wanna answer a question because he said if we remove a tooth, it's that mean we disturb the meridian. Okay, and uh, I, I am uh, Dr. Maya's mother and I'm a dentist, okay? <laughs> I, can, I can answer you a little bit. It's much better to be without teeth than infected teeth. Then extraction of infected tooth, is, it's very good for the body. It's not going to remove any of the meridian, okay? Remove the teeth. Then I like to say, even in the 40 or the 50 in Canada, they used to remove even healthy teeth to prevent <laughs> disease arthritis at that time, because they link it with the arthritis. They link the infection teeth. Of course, we don't do that now. But the answer is yes, infected tooth is very, very bad for the body. Better to stay without teeth than infected teeth. The, the gingivitis the straight to the heart, <laughs> infection of teeth, periapical lesion can do a lot. Then it's much better to, to live without teeth than infected teeth yeah. or gingivitis, all that kind, because the bacteria is linked straight to the heart, straight. And unfortunately, recently only, we have patient referred from cardiologists to us only now. Okay, but that's exists since long, long time. Then it's very important. Yes, there's the circuit, what Dr. Maya said, how each tooth was meridian, but if I remove that tooth, that means I remove some of the meridian? No. Of course, we prefer our, our work is to conserve the health of the mouth, the health of the teeth, but if the teeth are infected, remove it without any question even if we're not going to replace it. Of course, it's much better to replace the teeth, much, much better. Immediately, you see, if you have a patient, uh, advanced periodontal disease, advanced infection, the moment we remove his teeth, the color of his face going to change, his health change. Why? Because we remove the source of the bacteria. Then replacing, it's absolutely necessary. Okay, but better, have no teeth than infected teeth. <laughs> That's... Thank you so much. You have a question? Instagram. Yes, there was a question online, Dr. Maya, if you can please elaborate on um, mouth breathing at night. Like, is there a guard that a patient can use or what your practice does for that? Right, so uh, mouth breathing is tricky. What we want to make sure is that there is no apnea before we start mouth taping, okay? So there, there is a, a, a really great way of helping train the body to breathe through the nose. Breathing through the nose is very important for, I mean, many reasons, but two things that come straight to me is nitric oxide, which is a diet vasodilator, only comes when you breathe through your nose, not through your mouth. And the other thing is when you're breathing through your nose, your tongue is up against your palate where it should be, so your arches are developing. This is for children, developing properly. The other thing too, breathing through your mouth, dry mouth, saliva attack, 
all of that stuff. So um, what we like to do is we like to do a sleep study first. The proper way to do it is to conduct a sleep study. Nowadays, you don't have to go to a lab. It used to be you used to have to go to a lab, sleep like in like it's a hospital bed, you're hooked up to all of these things. How are they really evaluating the quality of your sleep? Now it's a sleep test that gets sent to your house directly. You hook it up. It's a small, you know, device. Sometimes it's as small as an aura ring that you wear, more sophisticated than an aura ring, believe it or not. But it's like a ring that you wear two nights in a row. You put it back in the box, you send it back, and a uh, the information gets uploaded to a board certified sleep physician, which evaluates you for how much apneic, hypopneic indexes you have. AHI index indicates how many times are you stopping to breathe at night and how many times does your oxygen, oxygen saturation stop and what is that doing to your heart? And you will either fall into the category of mild, medium, or severe. If you're mild or moderate, then you would qualify as an adult for uh, um, maybe a guard that you wear at night or a mandibular repositioning device that you wear at night to open your airway and to prevent the grinding. Because remember, grinding comes with sleep disturbances. We know that now. If you're severe, then one of the options is a CPAP a machine. You look like Darth Vader, kind of, and it you know pumps positive oxygen into your nose. Um, most people are very intolerant of that, but if you fall under the category of severe, then you fall into a CPAP category. Now, if this is something that you're afraid of or you know somebody or somebody in your family is snoring and you know they stop breathing and they start again, start with a sleep test. That's where I would go. Now, if it's a child who is mouth breathing, we're setting them up by ignoring it, we're setting them up for failure. So if it's a child that is mouth breathing, before you, you mouth, you can mouth tape, but be careful because if there's some apnea in there, you are not letting them breathe. So I would have them evaluated by a pediatric ENT, somebody who understands airway very well, make sure that there is no apnea and then look into whether or not tonsils need to be removed whether or not a orthodontics or myofunctional therapy to expand the airway needs to be involved so it's complex but be a, being intentional by testing and then going from there if you're an adult and you know that you don't have apnea because you had a test then you can try to mouth tape I had a question earlier about microphone. Again, why Listerine on Zoom? Uh, can you say again why Listerine? Uh, there's a, a lot of questions, and we're running a little over time, but okay. um, the one I, I fell on is why Listerine is bad for you. Okay because the ratio of good to bad bacteria and other um, bugs in the mouth needs to be balanced. If we wipe out all of the bugs, which is what Listerine does, we used to think Listerine wipes out only the bad bugs, but Listerine is wiping out the bad bugs and the good bugs. So that makes us susceptible to super pathogens. Stealth pathogens will come in because the good pathogens don't have a chance to repopulate and balance the, the microbiome. So what happens is it will wipe out the good and the bad and leave that microbiome susceptible to some nasty uh, bugs. And that has some ramifications to the heart and, and all of that stuff. So that's why we no longer use uh, Listerine. Try the oil pulling and try the oral probiotic and you will be pleasantly surprised. Do the, the spit test too. You'd be pleasantly surprised. Sometimes it's just a question of eating more beets because you don't have enough, enough nitric oxide in that microbiome. It's very, very, eye-opening when you do that test. I also have a question mm -hmm. um, in regards to um, the fluoride in the tap water. Mm -hmm. Some people think that if they boil it. Mm. Sorry. Fluoride in the water. Some people think that if they boil it, then it's okay to cook with and it's okay. So I don't know. No. Do you? No. Okay. It, it doesn't get boiled out. It needs to get filtered out. And not all filters filter fluoride. Filters are good at filtering other stuff, but there are only certain filters that filter out fluoride. So Dr. Mercola 
has a great um, filter system specific to filtering out fluoride and it can be an above counter so you know you let's say you cook it can be an above counter uh, filter that you use for cooking and it can also be an under the sink uh, filter that you hook up so it needs to be filtered out not boiled out Thank you. wow yes <laughs> yes <laughs> Okay, so what happens to the child who um, who had the nursery water and then you start to see like this coloration and all yes. of their teeth? So what treatments are available? Very difficult. This is something called fluorosis, okay? Um, fluorosis, because remember the fluoride is replacing and displacing everything. When you see fluorosis on teeth, you can almost bet that there's fluorosis in the bone as well brittle bones because the calcium not only got replaced on the teeth, it got replaced in the bones as well. And so I often get that question due to the appearance of the teeth. And the only solution for that is to do some, you know, cosmetic uh, work. And um, it's, it's an irreversible damage. It's an irreversible damage that occurs, unfortunately. Something like hyperparathyroidism can be used with having a lot of fluorosis or in your teeth. You're lifting all the calcium from your bone into your bloodstream. Could it could it be mistaken for a systemic disease like hyperparathyroidism? It can be it can be confused with many other systemic mm -hmm. conditions as well, including one thing that comes to mind is acid reflux. Um, uh, which is something that a lot of us suffer from. And a lot of us are being medicated just to mask the symptoms. Mm -hmm. So I have a patient, I had a patient in my chair the other day, always recurrent decay, signs of reflux, signs of acid erosion. And I said, you have acid reflux. No, I don't have it anymore. I take the pill. <laughs> you still have it. You just don't feel it. So, so when the pH, remember pH in the body is voltage, okay? So when the pH is out of whack, the body will try to get the calcium from anywhere else. And in situations like that, we'll take the, the calcium from the teeth and the bones and try to um, alkalinize the blood and the system. So yeah, it's for sure all interconnected, definitely. <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time.